a lot of the uh, regulatory changes seem rather ominous at first. Uh, they seem uh, very difficult technically. They can involve some skills and some resources that you may not have on site. Uh, in a lot of cases, the resources are going to be a little bit stretched, even with respect to contractor support and other resources that you might be able to get your hands on. Um, there are fairly straightforward ways to approach these. What my objective is for this segment is to go through and talk about the different requirements and cost-effective ways for approaching that. Uh, so I'd like to start with providing a little bit of background and the key elements of the modernization efforts for the regulations. And then after I talk about specific ways that you can approach it, general implementation strategies and resources that you might have that can help you get the job done. Uh, for each of the segments that we're going to do today, uh, if you look at your agenda, we do have a section at the very end where we're going to have the, um, all the speakers on podium to provide feedback. But I would encourage you to jump in and ask questions either during the presentations or at the end of each presentation as issues come up. Chances are if you've got a question, other people have questions too. All right, so what kind of changes are, are out there? When you look at the regulations, how many people have, have studied the, the uh, CalR Program 4 and the new Cal, Cal PSM requirements? Okay, a lot of people, um, you'll want to take a good look at these. When you, and, and also, as a, uh, to make it a little easier on you, we do have a link on that little uh, QR code in the back for easy access to where you can get copies of the regulations or view them. When you look at them, there's, good, there's a lot of things to pick up on. The types of changes that are out there, facility and program applicability is one of them. There are going to be changes to the threshold quantities. Uh, new facilities need to be brought in with respect to uh, refineries in California. Additional PHAs are going to be required for units that you wouldn't have PHA'd otherwise that are associated with refinery operations. Schedules have also shifted. Uh, problems have occurred in the past due to the delays in implementing recommendations and uh, keying recommendations from other things like incident investigation and compliance audits onto a timeline such that they'll get addressed properly uh, as something that hadn't been done before. So there's a lot of changes to schedule with respect to the new regulatory requirements, and then elements. There's a number of new elements that require new, th new analyses to be done and new things to manage at your plant site. So all these types of changes out there have been incorporated into the drafts for the CalR Program 4, Cal PSM uh, for refineries, and, and also for the, the new EPA changes too. Uh, these are the types of changes that are occurring. Uh, they're all working towards addressing what are perceived as deficiencies or at least improvements that could be made to address some of the events that have occurred within the past decade. Uh, this is the environment that you've got now for, for, it's for PSM. Uh, these, you're familiar with all the different elements, process safety information, process hazard analysis, operating procedures, etc. You're all familiar with those different regulatory requirements. This is the environment now, and although there are some uh, nuances and some differences between uh, offshore and onsh uh, onshore, the offshore being the the SEMS program or safety and environmental management systems uh, between California and other states, between California and federal, between PSM and RMP. Although there's all the there's a variety of uh, small differences, all of them revolve around these types of management system elements. Uh, what I'd like to do is talk about some of the new stuff and really focus on that. Uh, for convenience, I've kind of divided it into three categories, and also to provide some pictorial help. I've kind of color coded a bit. Again, it's subject. The color coding is subjective. The elements are what's proposed out there and in the regulations. The color coding is meant to, to draw your attention to things that may require a little bit more, uh, more effort on your part, and a requirement to go through and pay a little bit more attention to how that might impact your facility. Uh, red being the most, uh, possibly the biggest impact or extra work to be done. Greening, green meaning quite, pretty much very little additional effort on your part. Um, these are the, this is the new environment right now with respect to the CalArt Program 4 and Cal PSM for refineries. I'm going to focus on those and I'll be talking about the EPA's changes a little bit later. Um, Cal, Cal PSM for refineries and CalArt Program 4, the regulators have done a lot of work. Uh, they've had a lot of meetings as part of the Interagency Refinery Task Force and other groups to try to harmonize them as much as possible. There are some differences, but 
there's more similarities and differences and they've done a lot of work towards harmonizing them between the two programs. Um, in terms of applicability, again, the CalARP, the CalPSM for refineries, primarily for refineries and primarily for California. We'll talk about how else that, that how they might be applied elsewhere and LA County is going to have some words to say about how some of these things can be perceived as best practice and possibly apply to some program three facilities. But that, that'll be for a presentation later this morning. Um, the EPA, what the EPA's jurisdiction is different. They did, they did not harmonize with this and right now there's a, um, there's a there's significant differences between the EPA's proposed updates to RMP and Cal, CalR Program 4 and CalPSMR. I'm going to try to abbreviate this. This isn't official, but CalPSMR is again refineries for the PSM changes in California. 5189.1 is the um, CCR segment where, the, where these can be found. Again, it can be linked off our website pretty easily in the back. So let's talk about some of the elements. And again, the Program 4 requirements and CalPSM for refineries are primarily focused on refineries in California. The importance of why everybody needs to be watching this and aware of it, we'll be talking about in a little bit. So process safety information hasn't changed very much. Process hazard analysis, there's some new requirements for refinery units that hadn't previously been PHA'd. Uh, that's why it's in orange on the screen. Operating procedures has some additional nuances and you'll be developing a lot more of them for units that may not have been, you may not have been applied to operating procedures before, or at least didn't have to, unless you were applying them as part of best practice or just what you're doing. Training, contractor safety, pre-startup safety reviews also has not changed very much. Mechanical integrity, you've got some additional nuances, but the core part of the program, with the exception of an element I'll talk about next, really hasn't changed all that much. Mechanical integrity is your way to make sure that the equipment operates reliably. The next one is, is I have, I've marked in red because it has a pretty wide range of application. It also can mean a lot of extra work for refineries in areas that you may not have done so in, unless as part of your own best practices. Uh, damage mechanism reviews is an extension of a mechanical integrity program. And in, um, I believe it's the CalPSM, it's a separate section, I'm sorry, in CalARP, it's a separate section. In CalPSM, it's linked to mechanical integrity. Uh, damage mechanism reviews are, are something that is an extension of mechanical integrity focused on protecting that boundary, your containment of the hazardous materials at your plant site. Uh, it can involve additional metallurg metallurgical inspections on equipment. It can involve different um, hazard scenarios that are linked to PHAs. And we'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, inherently safer technology, hierarchy of hazard control analysis, and safer technologies and alternatives analysis are pretty much the same thing. Inherently safer technologies are, is a term you're probably familiar with as something that you've looked at or applied to your facilities in the past, uh, often as part as an extension of your process hazard analysis. Uh, hierarchy of hazard control analysis is the proper term used in both the uh, CalPSM for refineries and also CalARP Program 4, and it's meant to, uh, as, as part of the regulatory requirements, implement inherently safer technologies review, and as part of the review findings, there are uh, programmed uh, mechanisms for following through on any recommendations that come out of that. So on March 14th, the EPA came up with essentially the same concept, a little, some difference in requirements, and it's called Safer Technologies and Alternatives Analysis, uh, abbreviated here as STAA. These things can have a uh, fairly significant impact on your facility. Um, you may have to move more towards inherently safer technologies or justify why it's not feasible to do so. Uh, hot work permits hasn't changed very much. Management of change, few changes, nothing significant. Incident investigation and uh, root cause analysis. Uh, that's also in orange or that's also, um, root cause analysis is also being proposed as, one, as an additional item. It's in orange because it shouldn't be a lot of effort for most people who are applying best practices. If you have an incident and you're performing an investigation, doing a root cause analysis is pretty much considered best practice. So if you're already doing a best practice and applying root cause analysis for significant incidents as part of your incident investigation, you're probably in pretty good shape. 
If you're not doing that, there are additional regulatory requirements for in the, uh, in the uh, Cal PSM for refineries, in CalArt Program 4, and also in the EPA's new requirements. And another reason why I'm, I'm kind of talking about all these together is the uh, EPA's requirements are focused on certain facilities that are Program 3. They're not limited to a specific Program 4 for CalArp or um, separate PSM section for uh, refineries in California. So there's going to be a little bit of overlap to other uh, facilities that they consider highly hazardous facilities that are currently Program 3. Um, by the way, if uh, there are several, I'm going to apologize right now. There are lots of places to get tripped up on here. I have a hard time keeping up with the stuff. And I just put together a paper for the Global Congress on Process Safety trying to, trying to articulate all these things. It's very complicated. It's not just one program. It's, there's, there's mostly overlap in California, but the EPA's is very different, uh, and, it's, and the EPA doesn't have a program for. They're going to be, if you're a, a refinery in California, you're going to be subject to EPA Program 3 requirements, CalArp Program 4 requirements, and then a separate regulation, 5189.1. So it's a little complicated. Um, I'll apologize if, uh, if I trip up or don't explain things clearly. If you do have any troubles understanding this stuff or want me to elaborate, please let me know. Okay, so emergency planning and response. I put as red because the, um, there's several elements, and one Paul Penn's going to talk about this afternoon, that are looking at additional drills, additional emergency response activities. There are additional elements within the uh, 5189.1 and also CalArp Program 4. Uh, but what just came out from the EPA, one of the key four, key four items that they're looking at right now is additional drill requirements, training requirements, and interface with the, with the agencies. So that could involve a lot of extra work for a lot of facilities. Uh, employee participation, not a lot has changed there. Process safety culture assessment. Uh, that one is one I put as red because it's, it's an interesting concept, but it's, it's very nebulous. Uh, I, I've got background in chemical and mechanical engineering, very comfortable dealing with equipment, operating procedures, looking at specific scenarios that go on in a plant site. Um, I've been doing HAZOP studies for years. The process safety culture assessment is a little loose in terms of how do you look at culture at a, at a facility that is covered by these the CalArp PSM programs. So that's that's one I put in red. It has the potential for, it's something you want to watch carefully, that you want to have a very clear understanding between yourself and whoever is regulating you in terms of what, is, what exactly is required. Human factors also I put in red because there's a lot of potential there for looking into things that, that haven't been um, regulated before with respect to um, employee hours, uh, staffing levels, and a lot of other things. The other thing is management of organizational change, which kind of overlaps with these two in that it's anytime you change the organization, whether you've got additional people on staff, additional training requirements, or somebody new coming in, you really should be looking at how the organization's changing as part of that system that's, that's part of your management system. So that, that uh, management organizational change is another new element that could have a pretty significant impact at your facility. So human factors, management, organizational change, process safety, culture assessment, those are all new elements. Another new element is the PSM program requirements. Again, I call this Cal PSM for refinery elements. There's an analogous one for a management program in the CalArp program four. And uh, for PSM, it's just your PSM, PSM program management system. So, that's a quick overview of some of the new items and some of the areas that we flagged as being potentially more important or things that, that require a little bit of additional attention. Uh, this next table, I'm not going to go through every detail. Uh, it's for your reference. Uh, all these things, as I mentioned, are available for download through that uh, hyperlink, uh, through the URL that's in the back of the room. Uh, all of them can be uh, utilized and you can get as much information as you want off of those. Uh, they're, they're meant for everybody to use. The, our objective is to keep everybody informed and provide materials that you can find useful. Um, as I mentioned, in green process safety information, uh, not a whole lot of additional effort that's going to be required there. Uh, the one thing you want to watch out for is different things are treated in different sections. Uh, safeguard protection analysis, uh, it's a California only requirement. Uh, it's got a separate section in CalArt Program 4. It's embedded in the PHA section for, for PSM. 
operating procedures, again, a medium level um, of requirements for updates. And again, this, this table is just meant to provide a cross-correlation chart. Uh, mechanical integrity and DMR, as I mentioned before, PSM has DMR in a separate section, section K. It's embedded in the mechanical integrity section for CalR program four. So when you develop your programs, you want to make sure that whenever we develop a program for somebody, we put a clear roadmap in there in terms of, okay, here's the element that's being addressed. Here's the regulatory section that it's addressing. You'll want to make sure you're very careful about doing that if you're involved in updating your programs to meet the new CalARP or PSM requirements. Uh, as I mentioned before, inherently safer technology, hierarchy of hazard control analysis, and safer technologies and alternatives analysis. Uh, very mostly similar, using pretty much using the same term for something that's uh, very, very, very much the same. Uh, separate sections, though, for EPA requirements, CalARP, and also PSM. Um, talked about emergency planning and response. You want to keep your eyes open for that. A lot of potential for new issues there. Uh, the things that are California only, I've also put on this table because it's got dashes on the right-hand column for Program 2 and Program 3 for the EPA RMP requirements, process safety culture assessment, human factors, and management organizational change, and also the management system and management program, those are California only. And they apply to the facilities that are currently part of Cal Cal P California PSM requirements for refineries or, or the CalArt Program 4. All right. So again, this is a reference table, so it can provide a roadmap back to where you can find the details of these things and the regulations. So let's talk about some of the specifics now. What I'd like to do is some of the key findings from some of the events that occurred earlier this decade were related to process hazard analysis and mechanical integrity. Um, the emergency planning response element for the lessons learned in West Texas, those are being applied mostly by the EPA at the federal level. For a lot of the California uh, uh, updates to the regulations, they tend to pivot more on PHA and mechanical integrity. A lot of them point towards the um, uh, August 2012 event at the Chevron Richmond refinery as a catalyst for taking a second look at these regulatory requirements. So for PHA, we've got Safeguard Protection Analysis, or SPA, the uh, Inherently Safer Technologies Evaluations that we discussed previously, and overlapping with mechanical integrity is damage mechanism review. Damage mechanism review is really a, a hybrid of what you want to look at when you look at hazard analysis and you develop your mechanical integrity program. So let's talk about PHAs first. Again, as I mentioned before, uh, as embedded in the PHA, you've always uh, best practices have always required a look-see at inherently safer technologies. Uh, now it's specific. That, it's, that you're linking the damage mechanism review requirements, hierarchy of hazard control analysis requirements, and applying an iterative HCA method as part of addressing your PHA. Uh, the new PHA requirements also address recommendation closure timing, um, making sure that you retain the PHAs for the life of the process, not just the last couple of revisions, but for the life of the process. And there's, uh, there are a lot of new, there are new um, units at refineries that need to get looked at. Those have a timeline for looking at them, for making sure the PHA is done, and also integrating, as appropriate, hierarchy of hazard control analysis. Uh, part of the PHA, or, or linked closely with it, but it's identified as a separate element, is safeguard protection analysis. All right, what you're trying to do with safeguard protection analysis is really accomplish, and this codifies what's really been done as part of best practice whenever good PHAs have been done. The idea is to assess the effectiveness of the existing safeguards for each failure scenario and make sure that they're independent of the initiating event. Well, for those of you who do a lot of HAZAP studies or PHAs, how many folks here have been through a HAZAP study or PHA? Okay, good. Most of you have suffered through that. Terrific. Um, when you're doing that, your, your objective is to really flush out, make sure that you don't have common mode failures with your initiating, between your initiating events and your, your protection features. You're also trying to make sure that your protection features apply to the scenarios that you look at and uh, are, are functional for that scenario, that they actually do the job they're intended to. That's part of SPA. That's what SPA is trying to do. So if you've been doing good HAZAP studies, been doing good PHAs, you've really been flushing out these issues, and it doesn't 
mean a lot of extra work for the SPA. Um, the rec regulatory requirements are to look at passive, active, and also procedural safeguards, and they specifically call out LOPA, or layer of protection analysis, as one mechanism for doing that. Um, you need to document the risk reductions that are being that, that can be achieved if you make changes, and you need to either conduct the SPA as part of your PHA or make it a separate report, and there's a timeline associated with that. And also because it's closely linked with PHA, it also needs to be retained for the life of the process. Well, there's a lot of challenges with this. As, as people, we tend to, to uh, and, I, and I battle this all the time when I'm leading HAZOP teams, but you, people tend to not think of something as credible, and they tend to think ahead and apply safeguards as part of their justification for non-credibility. So the idea of SPA is to neutralize that, that tendency we all have as people to do that, and make sure that the safeguards are independently identified and they're, they're clearly suitable for that, that scenario. Um, so it's, it, the SPA is meant to address that challenge, also look at common mode failures between causal events and safeguards, and making sure operator response reliability is not overcredited. It's really easy for somebody who's been with a facility for long periods of time to be very comfortable with the environment and to think that they can handle all upset conditions because they have been handling a lot of upset conditions. The idea of the PHA is to look beyond that. So when you've done a best practices PHA, you've always uh, really challenged, can the operator do that? Can they properly, can their actions properly protect the system? Well, the SPA codifies that and ensures that that's looked at in a little bit more uniform manner. So how do you go about and do, do applying the SPA? Well, if you've been applying best practices for PHAs, you've really done, the, done that as the, the objective. If you identify root transmitters for the causes and also the safeguards, where is the signal coming from to make sure you don't have one transmitter that's initiating the event and also feeding one of your safeguards? A good PHA has already done that. So if you're doing that diligently and uh, making sure it's documented carefully, that is a practical way for addressing the SPA requirements. And so you're already doing that. Uh, the facilitator, if you're facilitating, you frequently have to remind the team of risk, uh, about risk ranking. Uh, remind them we need to look at the operator not uh, making mistakes or not being able to mitigate the, the uh, event properly. This is something that's done as part of good practice right now. Uh, also challenging the team on safeguard effectiveness. Always asking the team, hey, is that relief valve sized for this scenario? How's the set point? Is the set point below the design pressure? Asking these questions frequently, challenging the team. These are things that are done as part of best practice. So if so, then you're already addressing SPA requirements. Uh, partitioning safeguards as independent protection layers or as IPLs. It's really easy to kind of muddle these things together, but if you're very clear, especially in active safeguards, making sure that they get documented separately and are clearly identified, tag numbers, set points, functionality, that's, that's a good path towards addressing the SPA requirements. Um, alarms. I don't know how many, especially older PHAs that you pick up where they list out safeguards uh, and you see one alarm, two alarm, three alarms, all listed as separate items. Well, it kind of looks like, wow, I've got all these safety features. But there's an operator that has to respond to that. An operator's got to be in a place where they can hear it, uh, diagnose what's going on, uh, get up, uh, get approval for corrective actions, take corrective actions, and for the corrective actions to actually have the effect that you want to mitigate the accident or mitigate the event before it becomes an accident. So all these things are looked at when you do a good PHA, and if you group the alarms as one item because the operator is intimately involved, you're not fooling yourself or the team or somebody else that you've got a lot of safety features there. So grouping the alarms as a single safeguard is an easy way to put things in perspective. Uh, layer of protection analysis, it's a good way to go to provide additional insights. A lot of people are doing that right now. I find that it can help really provide some clarification into the importance of a scenario. That application of LOPA blends very well into SPA, um, especially if you apply them for high consequence or high risk scenarios. Another thing that can be done too is by applying LOPA or really clarifying the protection features you've got. Maybe if you're applying a high-end safety instrument of function, or some very exotic protection features, maybe it's not all that important or necessary.
All right, uh, we also already talked about operator response to alarms. As part of SPA, you're supposed to validate the effectiveness of your safeguards as part of safeguard protection analysis. So you want to make sure that the operator can do what they need to do, that they have the equipment, training, everything they need to make sure they can properly respond to alarms. All right, and again, if you're already doing best practices for PHA and HAZOP, you're probably already doing a lot of what it takes to address the SPA requirements that are on the books now. So let's talk about mechanical integrity. Uh, mechanical integrity really hasn't um, changed a lot. Uh, there's a little bit uh, requirement for clear instructions for safely conducting maintenance. Um, there's additional requirements for documentation, clarification of records retention, uh, cross-referencing to process safety information. Uh, there's references to RAGAGAP or recognized and generally uh, recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. You'll hear that term more later, and I'm going to be asking the regulators a little bit later to provide a little bit more background in terms of uh, some, some tips on how to best apply that. Um, these sort of things are, are part of the mechanical integrity program. Now, as I mentioned before, a key part of that, or a, a new piece to that, is damage mechanism reviews. Damage mechanisms are defined as mechanical, chemical, physical, or other process that results in equipment or material degradation. You're trying to keep the material that you want to keep in your process in the pipe. You don't want it to escape corrosion issues, um, other ways to have mechanical damage. All these things can lead to a release. This is uh, damage mechanism reviews are designed to look at those mechanisms and minimize the potential for release. The idea for this is to do it in conjunction with or prior to a PHA, and there are some timelines that are put forth in the regulations for when you need to do these. So if you're doing it as part of a separate analysis, there are this, it's a new element, and there are specific things that need to be done as part of the damage mechanism review. Um, and again, it can be done in tandem with the PHA. So a minimum, you're sp and these are called out in the regulatory requirements, you're to look at mechanical loading failures, things like ductile, uh, ductile fracture, brittle fracture, buckling, mechanical fatigue, erosion issues, corrosion issues, thermal fatigue type issues, uh, cracking such as stress corrosion cracking, embrittlement issues. All these types of things are to be looked at, <clears throat> and again, it's not meant to be limiting. You may have to look at a lot of other items too, to really make sure that you properly look at do your damage mechanism review. And like, like the new, new PHA requirements, DMRs must be, D, the DMR reports must be retained for the life of the process. And again, the idea, and this is illustrated in the figure in the lower right hand corner, is that, uh, rather than just a separate metallurgical review by a separate group that, does, that looks at your piping, you want to integrate this and understand the likelihood of failures how bad it can be, and that's a key part of your damage mechanism review. Of course, what does that sound like? It sounds a lot like what you're doing for a HAZOP study when you're looking at the consequences and you're looking at the likelihood of the scenario. So this integrates very well in with the PHA so that when you're looking at other types of scenarios, you can look at damage mechanisms that can lead to release and approach it in the same manner, prioritize it in the same manner, and make sure that you understand the scenario. A lot of scenarios that can lead to a release from a vessel or a pipe, whether it be a process upset that causes overpressurization or just simply old fashioned corrosion. You're looking at the same type of release, the same type of consequences. So a lot of these things dovetail very nicely with the efforts that you're already doing for process hazard analysis. Um, <clears throat> I put together this implementation spectrum just to provide a little bit of perspective on and a reminder that PSM, RMP and CalARP are performance-based requirements. There's no one way to do things. There's no absolute black and white, good or bad. You have to assess what is needed at your facility and apply the level of analysis, the level of maintenance needed for your facility. Uh, best practices right now, if they're enhanced, you can, uh, you can justify that they meet a lot of the DMR requirements. A lot of facilities that, that deal with that are pushing the boundaries on pressure and temperature and metallurgical conditions uh, have to get more towards a risk-based assessment where they have to go through and uh, quantify the likelihood of failures very carefully because the risk levels could be potentially very high. And then there's a whole range in the middle. 
Uh, there's uh, what we call an integrated PHA approach, and there's also what we call a prioritized DMR approach. You can you want to look at the situation at hand. How complicated is it technically? How corrosive or how how much of a potential problem it can be <clears throat> with respect to equipment failure, and make a decision on the level of analysis and how much detail you want to put into that. What we typically do is uh, a prioritized DMR approach, where we'll go through and in fact I think I have a slide on this. Yeah, let's talk about a suggested approach. Basically, right now, maintaining your current um, your current HAZOP and mechanical integrity programs and integrating them appropriately are is definitely appropriate. Uh, initiating high-value DMR activities as part of your prioritized DMR makes a lot of sense right now. And also applying quantitative techniques. There's a lot of API recommended practices and a lot of other things available to you to apply quantitative techniques when necessary. Uh, all these things are a good thing to do right now as you transition into this. It can be a lot of work. You don't want to wait till the regulations come out and you might be resource constrained. Now this prioritized DMR approach, I told you I was going to provide a little bit more details. Typically when we, uh, when we infuse this into, a, into something like a HAZOP study, it's pretty easy to um, look at the pressure and temperature limits of the equipment as you're looking at process upsets. For example, if you're overpressurizing a, a piece of uh, a vessel, you want to look at the piping that's associated with it. What are, the, what's it, what are the piping specs associated with this? Are you exceeding limits? Same thing for temperatures. If you have a thermal excursion, um, uh, a heater is misfiring such that it's firing too hot and you're raising the temperature of the process stream, well, compare, compare your uh, piping specs as you're doing that. Pretty easy to do. So it can be very easily an extension to what you're doing for, for a HAZOP study. Uh, also, what we tend to do is uh, that's on a scenario specific basis on a node level we'll go through a small checklist and check out the, the metallurgy and other characteristics of the node. And then at the HAZOP study level, we'll usually have a separate discussion to talk about their mechanical integrity program. So a prioritized approach where you focus your energies where it's needed is an easy way to build on your current programs and start addressing DMR requirements. So let's talk about hierarchy of hazard control analysis. <clears throat> this is a new element, as I mentioned, it's endorsed, uh, the EPA has just put out its safer technologies and alternatives analysis. This is something that's been done as part of inherently safer technologies for years. Uh, it's not going to go away and it can have a pretty big impact on your facility. The requirements are to look at first order inherent safety me uh, mechanisms such as preventing the accident by using safer chemicals, using uh, an inventory reduction of some, port, some part, or looking at independent protection layers passive, active, or procedural safeguards. All these are part of your hierarchy of hazard control analysis. You want to conduct it for existing processes. It may need to get looked at as part of PHA recommendations. It may also need to get looked at as part of MOC or if you've had an incident. Uh, so all these things can be trigger points for doing the hierarchy of hazard control analysis. It is something that can be easily done as part of a PHA. It can be potentially uh, have a big impact on your system. And there are specific requirements for how you justify if you don't need to make changes. Just by saying it's too expensive or we don't think it's technically feasible may not be good enough reasons why not to uh, as justifications for not improving the basic nature of your process. So again, this needs to be done very carefully. It, it can be integrated with your PHA as a lot of your IST activities are being done right now. HCA requirements are to reduce each risk to the greatest extent feasible. Uh, you've, you, need, you need to use control techniques or management systems, and these are things that can be achieved, have been achieved, or are used as part of best practices, either in your type of facility or something similar. Uh, there's, there was an iterative technique that's been proposed in the past. There are a variety of checklists out there, and there are resources uh, that are provided as part of this presentation, and that can also be downloaded uh, off our website. There is a requirement for the HCA to be a standalone analysis, but it can be easily integrated with the PHA. And again, as I mentioned, um, justifying something as not having to be done has to be done very carefully. You want to make sure you do a thorough HCA and have a, a basis for your conclusions. Uh, as I mentioned, linking this with the PHA 
Uh, usually when I'm uh, starting a HAZOP study, I'll review a lot of key inherently safer technology concepts. So people are thinking of, of them as you go through. And there are also specific checklists to look at. Um, typically, we document this as a separate node. It's pretty easy to do as an augmentation of your HAZOP study. And there are a variety of checklists that are out there. A good one is off of the CSB website that's on your screen right now. And there are a number of other checklists that are available. Uh, timing. Again, it's, it's important to do this as early as possible during the design phase. If you have major changes to your process, when do you want to know about it? As soon as possible. The later you find out or, or find out that there's a, a inherently safer technology or a major improvement that you need to do, it can get very expensive. So as, as, as soon as you can do that, as early as possible during the design phase, to minimize capital costs, the better. Also during plant operation, even if you're an operating facility, you want to get these things on the table, understand what may need to be done at the earliest possible opportunity. Uh, actions prior to promulgation, what you want to do right now, if you're doing a PHA, apply IST tech, uh, checklists. Pull this thing into your program. It's a lot easier to do now than having to retrofit it later. Also, there are going to be resource constraints. If you have, if you're looking at getting outside support or consultant support, a lot of these new uh, uh, PSM for refinery requirements for California or Keller Program 4 are going to be keeping a lot of people pretty busy. Um, you want to make sure technological advances are discussed or considered during the PHA and especially metallurgy. If there are, are metallurgical improvements that can be done while it's in the design phase before you get uh, before the plants commissioned and then you start going into a maintenance type program this can address uh, inherently safer technology concepts and also save a lot of money in the long run. And in addition to the CSB uh, website um, link that I just gave you, there are a number of textbooks that are out there on how to do this, some of the concepts that have been applied elsewhere. There's regulatory guidance, uh, Contra Costa County, uh, New Jersey Toxic Catastrophe Prevention Act, or TCPA. Those all have uh, opportunities or, or, or guidance documents that can be downloaded. And, and again, most of the guidance documents pivot on checklists. There's a lot of background information but the checklists are what can be easily applied during that during the HAZOP study. Um, I want to make sure I don't shortchange the next speaker, so I'm going to go through the next items fairly quickly. Uh, incident investigation, as I mentioned, root cause analysis is a uh, now codified as a requirement. EPA, uh, Cal, CalArt Program 4, and CalPSM for refineries <coughs> all refer to root cause analysis as a requirement. These, th these are things that are easily done as part of a thorough incident investigation. What you have to decide at the plant site is what level of incidents really require this. Again, all these PSM, RMP, and CalARP requirements are performance-based. Root cause analysis is required, but there's a little bit of play in terms of where you pull the trigger on when you want to apply it for certain types of incidents. So you want to make sure that's very clear in, your, in the programs that you create for your facility. Um, the root cause analysis, I won't get into too much detail. I teach root cause analysis courses, but these are things that are, that are easily applied where you're drilling down to find out what's behind causing the, causing the problems that ended up creating the incident. Oops. A process safety culture assessment. Um, you, you basically, the program needs to address uh, an encouragement for reporting safety concerns. Uh, making sure rewards don't deter reporting safety concerns, making sure safety is not compromised by production, uh, you make, make sure there's process safety leadership at all levels, making sure that human factors is properly addressed within the PSM program. These are all parts of having a process safety culture assessment and program at the, at the plant site. These are things that you look at for the assessment and that need to be put into your program. The program needs to include mechanisms to address process safety culture. How do you address the, the, the requirements or the findings of the process safety culture assessment? And so you need to make sure that it is infused into a report that's produced and into your management system. So this is something, again, it's a little fuzzy, but it's something that's required as part of both uh, uh, CalArt Program 4 and 5189.1. Uh, management organizational change, as I mentioned before, you're really looking at the level of um, of employment, how many people you put onto, onto, a, onto a project or on, onto managing a facility. 
if you're making changes, how are you addressing making sure there's enough people with the right capabilities to properly operate the facility? That doesn't include just the operators at, at the unit. It may include the management system behind that. And there's no clear boundaries on this, so you've got to be very careful how you apply that at your facility. Uh, as part of the MOC, you want to make sure job functions are up to date. And as part of the analysis that's done, it's got to be documented. Who, who did the analysis? And are you, are, you know, making sure you get proper representation from labor, from management, and from whatever other expertise that you bring in. And again, uh, it's closely linked with the human factors and has to also include a specific human factors analysis. Uh, I mentioned human factors before. Um, there needs to be a human factors program. It needs to be developed, implemented, and maintained. It needs to evaluate staffing levels. Obviously, a lot of these are coming from um, the unions to make sure to make sure that their personnel are properly protected and that they've got enough people on site to get the job done safely. Uh, the program needs to evaluate staffing levels, complexity for tasks, uh, levels of training, uh, human machine interface, physical challenges of the work environment, and also employee fatigue and shift work and overtime. This is a challenge for a lot of facilities, especially if you've got um, how do you deal with uh, people who are sick? Uh, if you've got people who, who can't come to work for a while, uh, how do you deal with these kind of issues is now part of your human factors program, which is again implemented as part of your management organizational change. Um, okay, good. So let's talk about some other regulatory issues. Uh, there's it's various interpretation letters that have come out. As I mentioned in our timeline earlier, <coughs> Federal OSHA had come up with a request for information to talk about several topics, several things that they were thinking about for improvements to PSM at the federal level. Right now, uh, fe the feds have not come up with a, a proposed update to federal PSM requirements. However, they've come up with a number of interpretation letters to address some of the specifics that have come out or, or the specific topics that they wanted to address as part of the request for information. Uh, re uh, recognize and generally accepted good engineering practices, enforcement, how do you go ahead and document that you're achieving RAGAREP, and also how is it enforced at the federal level. The retail exemption, uh, covered concentrations for facilities that need to address PSM as part of their safety program on site. Uh, there's a number of interpretation letters that are out there. Those are all also all linked on our website. Uh, in California, you've also got Senate Bill 612. Uh, this is a part of a general duty clause that is addressed, that, that's I think managed by the uh, Unified Program Agencies. Uh, it's got new requirements for looking at general duty issues at the plant site. It's also something that broadens the scope of what you're responsible for maintaining at the plant site. If, you're, if you have a general duty to protect personnel at the plant site, if for some reason you're not applying best practices, SB 612 can catch that and, identi and uh, identify that you're really not conforming to general du your general duty. And I've also provided a link for that too. So let's talk about, those are some of the specifics in terms of the program changes and what's being done. Let's talk about general implementation strategies. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of changes going on. A number of agencies are involved. Um, there is a, a lot of them focused on California with interface from the federal EPA and also some, uh, some involvement from uh, federal OSHA. Uh, this Chemical Safety Board, Interagency Refinery Task Force, Contra Costa County, City of Richmond, Cal OSHA, and also Cal OES and Cal EPA are the main drivers for that. And this is what's really driving a lot of the changes that are going on in California. So all these agencies are involved. So what are we, what are, what's on the horizon? What are we expecting from them? Uh, the Chemical Safety Board finished its evaluation. They came up with three reports. All of them were documented and included recommendations for both facility, for facilities, for agencies, um, and uh, for uh, actually, I guess facilities and agencies in California to address safety at plant sites. Um, those recommendations are out there. They've been uh, reviewed by the Interagency Refinery Task Force, and they've been acted on as part of the updates, the proposed updates that are currently being promulgated for CalR Program 4 and 5189.1. The US EPA, as I mentioned before, March 14th, Federal Register, 
if you need to see it, it's linked on our website. Uh, that's They've got a proposed rulemaking for updates to their risk management programs. This includes changes to Program 2 and 3 facilities at the federal level that in many cases are analogous to what we're looking at in California. Uh, the key elements of that, uh, as I mentioned before, emergency planning and response. Uh, root cause analysis is a key item. Safer tech technologies and alternatives analysis and also third-party audits. Uh, there's a requirement now, or proposed requirement, for um, if you need to do an audit and you're either requested by the agency or you've had an incident within a certain period that meets certain requirements, Program 2 and Program 3 facilities may be required to, do, uh, to use an independent auditor to do its compliance audit. Now, there are some nuances uh, uh, to that that are a little bit ominous in terms of limiting the qualifications of the third-party auditor. Uh, one of the requirements is that the auditor must not have worked with the, the owner-operator for the previous three years and also commit to not working for them for three years after that. Well, that really excludes um, anybody from your plant site, of course, and even for a third-party auditor, people that you've ever worked with before who may know your facility. So in a lot of respects, that can limit the resources that may be available to do a good audit at your plant site. So there's a lot of nuances to that that I'd encourage you guys to take a good look at with respect to um, with respect to these requirements. In red, and I'll mention it again, May 13th, tomorrow, is the deadline for comments. So if industry, agencies, anybody has comments on this, they need to get back to the EPA on this. Um, the uh, final promulgation of these requirements, after they get the comments, review the comments, right now it's scheduled for summer 2017 seems aggressive. Uh, the EPA has identified that's what they're shooting for. We'll, we'll have to see how this plays out. They will be getting a, a number of comments on this and we'll have to digest that. So there's a timeline associated with that. Uh, Federal OSHA, as I mentioned, they've uh, processed the request for information. They've, uh, they have not come up with uh, draft regulations. Uh, there's a rather long time period uh, that, that's involved with promulgating recommend, recommend, regulations from, from uh, federal OSHA. Uh, Contra Costa County and the city of Richmond, they'll be, uh, Contra Costa County representative will be talking about the industrial safety ordinance later today and uh, we'll, they'll be providing a lot more background that has a lot of elements that dovetail very closely with the, um, with the CalArt Program 4 requirements and also uh, California PSM for refineries. Uh, these things are being applied in Contra Costa County and um, they were an active part of the Interagency Refinery Task Force. Uh, the task force itself, there are periodic meetings that, that continue so people share ideas, but their main missions, which were to provide feedback to, for the updates to CalARP for in infusing Program 4 and for creating 5189.1 through CalOSHA, a lot of those have been completed and additional reports, the, an early report on refinery safety was issued shortly after the Richmond refinery accident and additional reports are not planned. Uh, Cal OSHA, the Cal PSM for refineries, as I mentioned, uh, September 2015, there was an updated draft, final regulation promulgation for uh, PSM for refineries and also California uh, CalArp Program 4 is estimated for spring 2017. And as I mentioned before, there's a lot of harmonization between the two programs to try to make it as straightforward as possible, but you do need to be very careful because there are some differences in timing, different section numbers, and some of, the, some of them are handled slightly different. But again, these are very minor nuances. Most of them are, are pretty much the same. Um, again, there was a, there's a formal update on the book for, an up, uh, for CalARP that was done in January 1st, 2015. Most of, these won't, most of the changes wouldn't affect most facilities. September 24th from last year, in tandem with the, uh, the 5189 update that was issued for, um, uh, for a current draft that's being promulgated. Uh, that was, that's currently uh, looking at spring 2017 to be promulgated in parallel with the PSM requirements. Okay, so where, where are we at right now? We're basically transitioning from this type of environment in uh, May 2016 where you've got uh, a lot of overlap for all the programs, federal and state, and we're looking at something quite a bit different now. Um, when, when these, 
do hit the books uh, in, in 2017, uh, you've got um, a lot of harmony between uh, CalARP Program 4 and CalPSM for refineries in California. The, but that's just for refineries or facilities that meet that classification or facilities that are asked to be doing some of these extra requirements based on the judgment of the, of the Unified Program Agency representatives, based on your history, your relationship, uh, your level of safety at the facility, and maybe some incidents that have occurred. So there can be a lot of variance across the board. Uh, the pink area I've tried to identify as uh, the, the PSM for refinery updates. Uh, again, focused on refineries initially. A lot of overlap in orange with the new requirements that are coming out of CalARP, which is the yellow area. Emergency planning and response is a little different from both those two and also for the federal, the new federal requirements. The new federal requirements I've put in red lettering. Uh, again, the EPA, the EPA March 14th Federal Register copy is focused on emergency planning and response. Program, and, uh, the compliance audits dash three is referring to a third party auditor requirement that doesn't exist for uh, Cal PSM for refineries or uh, CalArp Program 4 or any of the other programs in California. Uh, so th those are rather unique. Um, incident investigation, root cause analysis specified by EPA, and also safer technologies and alternatives analysis was also a, an element that's being proposed by the EPA in its March 14th draft. So those items are in red. It does overlap quite a bit uh, with the other program. Uh, these items do overlap with the, the CalArp Program 4 and Cal PSM for refineries. Um, those are the key things. And there's also, I put some linkages here between management of change and management of organizational change, mechanical integrity and damage mechanism reviews, and PHAs and safeguard protection analysis, because they are closely coupled. And they're the, these are in the, this orange region because they're requirements only of the new program for or 5189.1. So, the regulatory environment's changing quite a bit. What's coming up on the fairly near horizon is something that if you're managing this at a plant site, you want to be very careful about what is what what your facility requirements are, what what's the applicability for a different part your facility or different parts of the facility. And you want to have a very clear roadmap in your program to show that you're complying with the things that you need to comply with. Um, and also, what I want to do is, is talk about what should you be doing right now. Um, one of the things that, that I want to emphasize is that everybody should be watching this. Even if you think you're a simpler facility and, oh, gee, I'm not a refinery, so I don't have to do CalArt Program 4, you should be aware of these things and you should, be, you should have given some thought in terms of, gee, I'm aware of this and I don't need to do it and here's why. In case you have an accident or this is perceived as a best practice for your type of facility, or gee, it's a requirement for a refinery, and you're also processing uh, hydrocarbons, even if you don't have an SIC code like a refinery, that you may be thinking, you may be looked at as having to apply this as part of a best practice for that type of facility. So again, everybody should be aware of that. So what should you be doing right now is if you're a CalArp covered facility, obviously there were some new requirements that came out in January last year. That's a, that's a no-brainer. You want to make sure you adhere to those. Uh, if you're in Contra Costa County, uh, there are nine facilities in the county. It includes the city of Richmond. And you want to make sure that you're following the industrial safety ordinance. Uh, for California petroleum refineries, if you're a specific SIC code for that, you want to be applying some of these uh, elements like inherently safer technologies or the hierarchy of hazard control analysis as early as possible. If you're putting in a new unit, now is the time to be thinking about that. So you're not hit between the eyes later, having to do a lot of very expensive retrofits at your facility. Um, I have had several regulators that have identified if you're making progress on these things and you're addressing the priority elements, again, it's a performance-based program, uh, they're, they're going to be looking elsewhere for problems rather than your facility or for things that you seem to be on top of. So there's going to be some limited resources out there for people who know what they're doing in these areas. If you can get on top of this at, at the earliest possible time, it will benefit you in the long run. Now, some of these things aren't lead time items, but things like uh, damage mechanism reviews, hierarchy of hazard control analysis, safeguard protection analysis, these are things that if you do now can be fairly simple 
and save a lot of pain and aggravation later. Okay. Um, everybody should be aware of this. Uh, the, the 5189 requirements, the CalArt Cal Program 4, whether you're a facility in California that it specifically applies to, or you've got another facility like that outside California, you should be aware, aware, aware of this because they may be considered best practices for your type of facility. If you're applying these extra elements and these additional things in California, why shouldn't they be applied elsewhere? Does that mean people's lives in California are higher value or more worthy of protection? If you're an owner operator of multiple refineries in California and in elsewhere other parts of the country, and if your refinery in another part of the country has an accident and somebody's seriously hurt, that could have, then the accident could have been prevented by applying some of the things that, that are being done in California, you should at least have some justification why you weren't doing that because they can be, these things can be looked at as best practices. Everybody should be closely monitoring the regulatory changes. Uh, the EPA's Program 2 and Program 3 changes are already applying some of those elements outside the context of refineries outside of California. So a lot of these things, are there's no clear boundaries on, oh gee, I've got only this SIC code, I only need to worry about this, or I'm only in California, I, don't, I need to worry about this or I'm in New Mexico, I'm safe, I don't have to worry about any of these regulatory requirements. These things are, you know, these things are, do have to get looked at as part of best practices. They can be expanded. There are provisions in general duty clauses and, and uh, the way the EPA has written the regulations, even the way the uh, CalARP regulation is written, such that it can, be, it can be extended beyond those specific SIC codes. So again, you want to be taking, being active on this. If it applies to you, if it can be done early, you might want to get started on this. So resources. I'm not going to go through this at all other than just to identify the topics. There's a lot of information out there. Risk management professionals gets actively involved in an outreach program. Most of you have probably seen some of our webinars. We try to disseminate best practices and what people are doing. Uh, we write papers. There's all sorts of stuff on the internet that where you can get information and checklists to help you help you work through this. Um, the paper that, that we gave just a month ago, it'll, it's available for download, gets into a lot more detail than I can do on the podium right now. I've also gone through this very quickly for another reason. We actually have representatives from these different agencies on podium presenting today. They can go ahead and provide a better elaboration on these and provide some more details and respond to any questions that you might have, probably even better than I can. So these are resources available to you. You've got a lot on the internet things to look at for webinars, people to talk to in the room today, take advantage of it. All these things can have significant impacts at your facility and um, if you're in this room, you're probably responsible for, pre for the programs at that facilities. You want to be make sure you're as knowledgeable as possible on this stuff. And uh, again, and this is on a, that QR code in the back, what we try to do, it's, this is a dynamic environment, that's the overall theme of the seminar today. But we try to keep on top of, of these regulations as they're being updated and encapsulated in a, in a uh, one page so you can look at what all the agencies are doing, or at least all the agencies that address safety management systems. All right, so there, agencies are taking a fresh look at safety management system programs. California and refineries have the biggest challenges, uh, the biggest changes that are applying here. It, it does have a potential for expansion linking to general duty clause, linking to best practices. Everybody needs to be at least aware of this and thinking about what should I be doing at my facility. Um, again, there's, there's a, I think I see a long-term movement towards synchronization. Uh, initially, the earlier drafts that came out for the CalArt Program 4 and uh, the 5189, they, were, they weren't nearly as harmonized as they are now. There's a general recognition that it may, it may not seem like it, but there's a general recognition that keeping regulations simple means that people can apply them more effectively and focus their efforts. Again, it may not see, seem like it based on the new, new items that are being added, but that's recognized not just by industry, but also by regulators. So over time, I see a lot of these things increase, increased synchronization, not only at the state level, but also at the federal level, and, and hopefully it'll be easier. But in the near term, uh, flipping back to that little, um, bubble chart that I provided a little, little while ago. It is going to be complicated. You do have to be careful. 
you really have to be eyes open and really take a good look at your programs. And again, there are easy steps right now to, to, um, to make progress and, and alleviate some of the effort later on. Uh, again, anybody who's in the risk manager or, or is a process safety professional should carefully monitor the modernization programs, take a good look at these regulations, and focus on charting the long-term success of your, the programs at your facility. And make sure you have a good strategy for effectively implementing them. All right, good. I finished a few minutes early, which is exactly what I wanted. I will be happy to take some questions uh, before the before we get the next speaker going. Like the, in that neutral um, barrier between, you know, we work closely with industry, we're, we're devising the programs, we're providing the technical resources, but we also work closely with the regulators, so we kind of see both perspectives on that. And uh, the CalR program itself, you've got uh, about 100 unified program agencies, each with um, one, two, or more representatives who are enforcing the program. Uh, that's quite a challenge to uh, fund train to, to so they, they can deal with all these additional requirements. So that's I think it's a valid question. It's certainly a concern of mine. And I'll let the agencies go ahead and address the two questions. Uh, number one, do you see any measurable changes toward to the current proposed updates between now and spring 2017? And what are you doing about funding? Actually, uh, we've got a microphone somewhere. Oh, yeah, Fariba's got the microphone. I am, I am not really intimately involved in these negotiations, but our, uh, our leader, Clive Trombez, who I call Top Cat, is very involved. <laughs> and I don't expect anything to change from here on. I think all the changes have happened. It is always possible. It depends on if there's a really strong reaction in the regulated community sometimes, uh, as evidenced by the Fed's effort to uh, deny the retail trade exemption for fertilizers. There was a reaction to that, quite unexpected, and uh, that's being held up right now. But uh, in answer to your other question, funding, we're loaded with money right now. We're just loaded with money. We're spending tons of money on training because there's this assessment that's been done to refineries for the most part, voluntarily agreed to this assessment. And we have more staff in the Process Safety Management Unit, more money than we've ever had. And we're trying to live up to that. I'm with uh, Cal OSHA, Process Safety Management. And I'm the person who tries to set up training courses, train our people in some of these new concepts. And what I find is, he did a very good job, by the way, of presenting these. But what I also find is, if you read the on the Costa County Industrial Safety Ordinance, you will understand the direction we're going in. 
you read that, understand what they have, to meet that here where it's not required, you'll be pretty close to meeting the DSM R, as he calls it, 3.8, 9.1. All right, I'll also, uh, Mike Deering is going to be one of our speakers this afternoon, shortly after lunch. Um, and he'll be, do, do we have any other agency personnel when we talk about funding or, good. Fadima Khalidan, I'm with LA County Fire Department. I'm one of the CalArp inspectors. Some of you um, in the room may know me from your facility. Um, regarding the two initial questions, one was um, the changes from the initial set of regulations, and as Steve alluded to, the fact that like a funnel, as it's as um, time approaches, there have been less and less changes. There may be a few changes. But you're seeing sort of the most complete form. And there has been uh, a consistent effort to marry both the PSM regulations and the CalARP regulations so that they are pretty consistent um, and they do not contradict one another. And that's the interagency refinery task force that has been responsible for doing that. Um, and there has been input along the way by um, not only other regulatory agencies, but mainly also facilities and the regulated community. On the second question uh, regarding funding, um, most of that funding um, actually has gone to Cal OSHA. Uh, it has not really gone to, I'm being very honest, it has not gone to the actual 82. We have 82 unified program agencies in California. and. Um, most of that funding has not trickled down to us. However, we have also, they have been very kind, Cal OSHA, that have extended their training to us. So some of us have participated in uh, the training that has occurred, but we are not um, floating in money uh, <laughs> by, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but um, what I do want to reiterate is that all the regular, uh, all the agencies here are your resources. And as a local um, Hoopa, I want to just make sure that you're aware that we try to really answer any questions, concerns that you have. We always try to uh, basically help all the regulated community um, in the room. So we're at your disposal, as well as all the other agencies that are here today. Excellent. Thank you, Fariba. Voting in money is a relative term. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now extending a training opportunity to Fariba. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you guys. That's what you've got there, depending on if you've had incidents or if the EPA sees you as somebody who hasn't done good quality auditing in the past and needs to do third party audits. Emergency planning and response. Uh, they're going to be, uh, to satisfy those requirements, if they're promulgated, uh, those, those may require some additional drilling efforts on your end. Safer technologies and alternatives analysis. Obviously, if you're using chlorine gas, you do have options, albeit possibly expensive, for, for other types of water of, of disinfection. Uh, you'll want to be able to justify, you'll have to justify why you're doing what you're doing. And then, of course, if you do have incidents, the, the requirements for a root cause analysis are going to apply to you. So state level, really nothing directly impacting the uh, large bulk chlorine gas users unless in the, in the UPA's judgment that you need to be uh, moved from the Program 3 requirements to select application of Program 4 requirements for CalARP. But I, I want to go back to one thing that uh, was a comment brought, brought up earlier. This is the first iteration, the first draft of the EPA's proposed updates to the risk management program rule. I would be willing to put a lot of money on the fact that there will be changes. Uh, risk management professionals will be commenting on, on at least the third party auditing part of that. And I still will be, because I'm also doing this at the last minute. I'm looking at the May, th May 13th deadline. Everybody remember that. Friday the 13th isn't, that means a lot of things. It also means that that's a deadline for comments to the EPA 
I have professional concerns, even though it's a boon for consultants and work consultancy, I have professional concerns about the limitations they're placing on third party audits in terms of the effectiveness and their ability to get good quality auditors. I think they're, I think they're setting the program up for failure in terms of uh, what they're trying to achieve, which is, which is a safe environment for personnel. Anyhow, we'll be providing formal comments to the EPA. Okay, did that help? Okay. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, good. We are right on time, and I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Kay Lawrence with the EPA Region 9.